सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ सोशल साइंस फॉर क्लास एट एन टाइटल्ड आर पास थ्री टेक्स्ट बुक इन हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास एट दिस इज द लेसन सिक्स वीवर्स आयन स्मेल्टर्स एंड factory owners from page 65 to page 80 let's listen to the lesson 6 weavers iron smelters and factory owners page 65 this chapter tells the story of the crafts and industries of india during british rule by focusing on two industries namely textiles and iron and steel both these industries were crucial for the industrial revolution in the modern world mechanized production of cotton textiles made britain the foremost industrial nation in the 19th century and when its iron and steel industry started growing from the 1850s britain came to be known as the workshop of the world the industrialization of britain had a close connection with the conquest and colonization of india you have observed in chapter 2 how the english east india company's interest in trade led to occupation of territory and how the pattern of trade changed over the decades in the late 18th century the company was buying goods in india and exporting them to england and europe making profit through this sale with the growth of industrial production british industrialists began to see india as a vast market for their industrial products and over time manufactured goods from britain began flooding india how did this affect indian crafts and industries this is the question we will explore in this chapter figure 1 trading ships on the port of surat in the 17th century surat in gujarat on the west coast of india was one of the most important ports of the indian ocean trade dutch and english trading ships began using the port from the early 17th century its importance declined in the 18th century page 66 indian textiles and the world market let us first talk about textile production around 1715 before the british conquered bengal india was by far the world's largest producer of cotton textiles indian textiles had long been renowned both for their fine quality and exquisite craftsmanship they were extensively traded in southeast asia java sumatra and penang and west and central asia from the 16th century european trading companies began buying indian textiles for sale in europe memories of this flourishing trade and the craftsmanship of indian weavers is preserved in many words still current in english and other languages it is interesting to trace the origin of such words and see what they tell us words tell us histories european traders first encountered fine cotton cloth from india carried by arab merchants in mosul in present day iraq so they began referring to all finely woven textiles as muslin a word that acquired wide currency when the portuguese first came to india 
in search of spices, they landed in Calicut on the Kerala coast in southwest India. The cotton textiles which they took back to Europe along with the spices came to be called Calico, derived from Calicut and subsequently Calico became the general name for all cotton textiles. There are many other words which point to the popularity of Indian textiles in Western markets. In figure 3, you can observe a page of an order book that the English East India Company sent to its representatives in Calcutta in 1730. The order that year was for 5,89,000 pieces of cloth. Browsing through the order book, you would have observed a list of 98 varieties of cotton and silk cloths. These were known by their common name in the European trade as piece goods, usually woven cloth pieces that were 20 yards long and 1 yard wide. Figure 2 Patola Weave Mid-19th Century Patola was woven in Surat, Ahmedabad and Patan. Highly valued in Indonesia, it became part of the local weaving tradition there. Page 67 Now observe the names of the different varieties of cloth in the book. Amongst the pieces ordered in bulk were printed cotton cloths called chintz, kosais or khassa and bandana. Do you know where the English term chintz comes from? It is derived from the Hindi word chint, a cloth with small and colourful flowery designs. From the 1680s, there started a craze for printed Indian cotton textiles in England and Europe, mainly for their exquisite floral designs, fine texture and relative cheapness. Rich people of England, including the Queen herself, wore cloths of Indian fabric. Similarly, the word bandana now refers to any brightly coloured and printed scarf for the neck or head. Figure 3 A page from an order book of the East India Company, 1730. Notice how each item in the order book was carefully priced in London. These orders had to be placed two years in advance because this was the time required to send orders to India, get the specific cloths woven and shipped to Britain. Once the cloth pieces arrived in London, they were put up for auction and sold. Figure 4 Jamdani Weave Early 20th Century Jamdani is a fine muslin on which decorative motifs are woven on the loom, typically in grey and white. Often, a mixture of cotton and gold thread was used as in the cloth in this picture. The most important centres of Jamdani weaving were Dhaka in Bengal and Lucknow in the United Provinces. Page 68 Originally, the term derived from the word bandhana, which is Hindi for tying and referred to a variety of brightly coloured cloth produced through a method of tying and dyeing. There were other cloths in the order book that were noted by their place of origin. Kasim Bazar, Patna, Calcutta, Orissa, Charpur. The widespread use of such words shows how popular Indian textiles had become in different parts of the world. Figure 5 Printed design 
on fine cloth or chintz produced in Masuli Patnam, Andhra Pradesh, mid 19th century. This is a fine example of the type of chintz produced for export to Iran and Europe. Figure 6 Bandana design, early 20th century. Notice the line that runs through the middle. Do you know why? In this orni, two tie and dye silk pieces are seamed together with gold thread embroidery. Bandana patterns were mostly produced in Rajasthan and Gujarat. Page 69 Indian Textiles in European Markets By the early 18th century, worried by the popularity of Indian textiles, wool and silk makers in England began protesting against the import of Indian cotton textiles. In 1720, the British government enacted a legislation banning the use of printed cotton textiles, chintz, in England. Interestingly, this act was known as the Calico Act. At this time, textile industries had just begun to develop in England. Unable to compete with Indian textiles, English producers wanted a secure market within the country by preventing the entry of Indian textiles. The first to grow under government protection was the Calico printing industry. Indian designs were now imitated and printed in England on white muslin or plain, unbleached Indian cloth. Competition with Indian textiles also led to a search for technological innovation in England. In 1764, the spinning jenny was invented by John Kay, which increased the productivity of the traditional spindles. The invention of the steam engine by Richard Arkwright in 1786 revolutionized cotton textile weaving. Cloth could now be woven in immense quantities and cheaply too. However, Indian textiles continued to dominate world trade till the end of the 18th century. European trading companies, the Dutch, the French and the English made enormous profits out of this flourishing trade. These companies purchased cotton and silk textiles in India by importing silver. But, as you know from Chapter 2, when the English East India Company gained political power in Bengal, it no longer had to import precious metal to buy Indian goods. Instead, they collected revenues from peasants and zamindars in India and used this revenue to buy Indian textiles. Activity Why do you think the act was called the Calico Act? What does the name tell us about the kind of textiles the act wanted to ban? What is spinning jenny? It is a machine by which a single worker could operate several spindles onto which thread was spun. When the wheel was turned, all the spindles rotated. Figure 7 A sea view of the Dutch settlement in Cochin, 17th century. As European trade expanded, trading settlements were established at various ports. The Dutch settlements in Cochin came up in the 17th century. Notice the fortification around the settlement. Page 70 Where were the major centres of weaving in the late 18th century? Figure 8 Weaving centres from 1500 to 1750 If you observe the map, you will notice that textile production was concentrated in four regions in the early 19th century. Bengal 
was one of the most important centers. Located along the numerous rivers in the delta, the production centers in Bengal could easily transport goods at distant places. Do not forget that in the early 19th centuries, railways had not developed and roads were only just beginning to be laid on an extensive scale. Dhaka in eastern Bengal, now Bangladesh, was the foremost textile centre in the 18th century. It was famous for its malmal and jamdani weaving. If you look at the southern part of India in the map, you will see a second cluster of cotton weaving centres along the Koromandal coast, stretching from Madras to northern Andhra Pradesh. On the western coast, there were important weaving centres in Gujarat. Here we have a map. Star represents plain white. A cross represents checks and stripes. A diamond represents chintz. A triangle represents silk. Lahore was known for plain white and checks and stripes. Sirhind was known for plain white and checks and stripes. Samana was known for plain whites, checks and stripes and chintz. Patan was known for chintz and silk. Sironj was known for silk. Ahmedabad was known for plain white, chintz and silk. Kambi was known for plain white. Surat was known for plain white and checks and stripes. Nigapatnam was known for plain white. Pondicherry was known for plain white and checks and stripes. Madras was known for plain white, checks and stripes, and chintz. Petaboli was known for plain white and chintz. Calcutta was known for plain white, checks and stripes, and chintz. Dakka was known for plain white and chintz. Patna was known for plain white and chintz. Banaras was known for silk. Barhanpur was known for plain white, checks and stripes and chintz. Sironj was known for chintz. Page 71 Who were the weavers? Weavers often belonged to communities that specialized in weaving. Their skills were passed on from one generation to the next. The Tanti weavers of Bengal, the Julahas or Momin weavers of North India, Sail and Kaikolar and Devangs of South India are some of the communities famous for weaving. The first stage of production was spinning a work done mostly by women. The charkha and the takli were household spinning instruments. The thread was spun on the charkha and rolled on the takli. When the spinning was over, the thread was woven into cloth by the weaver. In most communities, weaving was a task done by men. For coloured textiles, the thread was tied by the dyer known as Rangres. For printed cloth, the weavers needed the help of specialist block printers known as chipigars. Handloom weaving and the occupations associated with it provided livelihood for millions of Indians. The decline of Indian textiles. The development of cotton industries in Britain affected textile producers in India in several ways. First, 
Indian textiles now had to compete with British textiles in the European and American markets. Second, exporting textiles to England also became increasingly difficult since very high duties were imposed on Indian textiles imported to Britain. By the beginning of the 19th century, English made cotton textiles successfully ousted Indian goods from their traditional markets in Africa, America and Europe. Thousands of weavers in India were now thrown out of employment. Bengal weavers were the worst hit. English and European companies stopped buying Indian goods and their agents no longer gave out advances to weavers to secure supplies. Source 1. We must starve for food. In 1823, the company government in India received a petition from 12,000 weavers stating, Our ancestors and we used to receive advances from the company and maintain ourselves and our respective families by weaving company's superior assortments. Owing to our misfortune, the Orangs have been abolished ever since because of which we and our families are distressed for want of the means of livelihood. We are weavers and do not know any other business. We must starve for food if the Board of Trade do not cast a look of kindness towards us and give orders for clothes. Proceedings of the Board of Trade 3rd February 1824 Figure 9 A Tanti weaver of Bengal painted by the Belgian painter Solvins in the 1790s. The Tanti weaver here is at work in the pit loom. Do you know what a pit loom is? Orang, a Persian term for a warehouse, a place where goods are collected before being sold, also refers to a workshop. Page 72 Source 2 Please publish this in your paper. One widowed spinner wrote in 1828 to a Bengali newspaper Samachar Darpan detailing her plight. To the editor, Samachar I am a spinner. After having suffered a great deal, I am writing this letter. Please publish this in your paper. When my age was 22, I became a widow with three daughters. My husband left nothing at the time of his death. I sold my jewellery for his shrad ceremony. When we were on the verge of starvation, God showed me a way by which we could save ourselves. I began to spin on Takli and Charkha. The weavers used to visit our houses and buy the Charkha yarn at three tolas per rupee. Whatever amount I wanted as advance from the weavers, I could get for the asking. This saved us from cares about food and cloth. In a few years' time, I got together rupees 28. With this, I married one daughter and in the same way all three daughters. Now, for three years, we two women, mother-in-law and me, are in want of food. The weavers do not call at the house for buying yarn. Not only this, if the yarn is sent to market, it is still not sold even at one-fourth the old prices. I do not know how it happened. I asked many about it. They say that Bilati to yarn is being imported on a large scale. The weavers buy that yarn and weave. People cannot use the cloth out of this yarn even for two months. It rots away. A representation from a suffering spinner.
distressed weavers wrote petitions to the government to help them. But worse was still to come. By the 1830s, British cotton cloth flooded Indian markets. In fact, by the 1880s, two-thirds of all the cotton clothes worn by Indians were made of cloth produced in Britain. This affected not only specialist weavers but also spinners. Thousands of rural women who made a living by spinning cotton thread were rendered jobless. Handloom weaving did not completely die in India. This was because some types of cloths could not be supplied by machines. How could machines produce saris with intricate borders or cloths with traditional woven patterns? These had a wide demand not only amongst the rich but also amongst the middle classes. Nor did the textile manufacturers in Britain produce the very coarse cloths used by the poor people in India. Activity Read Sources 1 and 2 What reasons do the petition writers give for their condition of starvation? Page 73 You may have heard of Sholapur in Western India and Madura in South India. These towns emerged as important new centres of weaving in the late 19th century. Later, during the national movement, Mahatma Gandhi urged people to boycott imported textiles and use handspun and hand-woven cloth. Khadi gradually became a symbol of nationalism. The charkha came to represent India and it was put at the centre of the tricolour flag of the Indian National Congress adopted in 1931. What happened to the weavers and spinners who lost their livelihood? Many weavers became agricultural labourers. Some migrated to cities in search of work and yet others went out of the country to work in plantations in Africa and South America. Some of these handloom weavers also found work in the new cotton mills that were established in Bombay, which is now Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Sholapur, Nagpur and Kanpur. Cotton mills come up. The first cotton mill in India was set up as a spinning mill in Bombay in 1854. From the early 19th century, Bombay had grown as an important port for the export of raw cotton from India to England and China. It was close to the vast black soil tract of western India where cotton was grown. When the cotton textile mills came up, they could get supplies of raw material with ease. Figure 10 Workers in a cotton factory circa 1900 photograph by Raja Deen Dayal. Most workers in the spinning department were women, while workers in the weaving departments were mostly men. Page 74 By 1900, over 84 mills started operating in Bombay. Many of those were established by Parsi and Gujarati businessmen who had made their money through trade with China. Mills came up in other cities too. The first mill in Ahmedabad was started in 1861. A year later, a mill was established in Kanpur, in the United Provinces. Growth of cotton mills led to a demand for labour. Thousands of poor peasants, artisans and agricultural labourers moved to the cities to work in the mills. In the first few decades of its existence, the textile factory industry in India faced many problems. It found it difficult to compete with the cheap textiles imported from Britain. In most countries, 
government supported industrialization by imposing heavy duties on imports. This eliminated competition and protected infant industries. The colonial government in India usually refused such protection to local industries. The first major spurt in the development of cotton factory production in India, therefore, was during the First World War, when textile imports from Britain declined and Indian factories were called upon to produce cloth for military supplies. The Sword of Tipu Sultan and Wood's Steel We begin the story of Indian steel and iron metallurgy by recounting the famous story of Tipu Sultan, who ruled Mysore till 1799, fought four wars with the British and died fighting with his sword in his hand. Tipu's legendary swords are now part of valuable collection in museums in England. But do you know why the sword was so special? The sword had an incredibly hard and sharp edge that could easily rip through the opponent's armour. This quality of the sword came from a special type of high carbon steel called woods, which was produced all over South India. Wood steel, when made into swords, produced a very sharp edge with a flowing water pattern. This pattern came from very small carbon crystals embedded in the iron. Francis Buchanan, who toured through Mysore in 1800, a year after Tipu Sultan's death, has left us an account of the technique by which wood steel was produced in many hundreds of smelting furnaces in Mysore. In these furnaces, iron was mixed with charcoal and put inside small clay pots. Through an intricate control of temperatures, the smelters produced steel in gods that were used for sword making not just in India but in West and Central Asia too. What is smelting? It is the process of obtaining a metal from rock or soil by heating it to a very high temperature or of melting objects made from metal in order to use the metal to make something new. Figure 11 Tipu's sword made in the late 18th century Written with gold on the steel handle of Tipu's sword were quotations from the Quran with messages about victories in war. Notice the tiger head towards the bottom of the handle. Page 75 Woods is an anglicized version of the Kannada word Ukku, Telugu Hukku and Tamil and Malayalam Urukku meaning steel. Indian Woods steel fascinated European scientists. Michael Faraday, the legendary scientist and discoverer of electricity and electromagnetism, spent four years studying the properties of Indian woods from 1818 to 1822. However, the wood steel making process, which was so widely known in South India, was completely lost by the mid 19th century. Can you guess why this was so? The swords and armor making industry died with the conquest of India by the British and imports of iron and steel from England displaced the iron and steel produced by craftspeople in India. Abandoned furnaces in villages. Production of wood steel required a highly specialized technique of refining iron. But iron smelting in India was extremely common till the end of the 19th century. In Bihar and Central India, in particular, every district had smelters that used local deposits of ore to produce iron 
which was widely used for the manufacture of implements and tools of daily use. The furnaces were most often built of clay and sun-dried bricks. The smelting was done by men while women worked the bellows, pumping air that kept the charcoal burning. Activity Why would the iron and steel making industry be affected by the defeat of Nawabs and Rajas? What is bellows? It is a device or equipment that can pump air. Figure 12 Iron Smelters of Palamau, Bihar Page 76 By the late 19th century, however, the craft of iron smelting was in decline. In most villages, furnaces fell into disuse and the amount of iron produced came down. Why was this so? One reason was the new forest laws that you have read about in Chapter 4, when the colonial government prevented people from entering the reserved forests, how could the iron smelters find wood for charcoal? Where could they get iron ore? Defying forest laws, they often entered the forests secretly and collected wood, but they could not sustain their occupation on this basis for long. Many gave up their craft and looked for other means of livelihood. In some areas, the government did grant access to the forest, but the iron smelters had to pay a very high tax to the forest department for every furnace they used. This reduced their income. Moreover, by the late 19th century, iron and steel was being imported from Britain. Iron smiths in India began using the imported iron to manufacture utensils and implements. This inevitably lowered the demand for iron produced by local smelters. By the early 20th century, the artisans producing iron and steel faced a new competition. Figure 13. A village in central India where the Agariyas, a community of iron smelters, lived. Some communities like the Agariyas specialized in the craft of iron smelting. In the late 19th century, a series of famines devastated the dry tracts of India. In central India, many of the Agaria iron smelters stopped work, deserted their villages and migrated, looking for some other work to survive the hard times. A large number of them never worked their furnaces again. Source 3. A Widespread Industry According to a report of the Geological Survey of India, iron smelting was at one time a widespread industry in India and there is hardly a district away from the great alluvial tracts of the Indus, Ganges and Brahmaputra in which slag heaps are not found. For the primitive, iron smelter finds no difficulty in obtaining sufficient supplies of ore from deposits that no European iron master would regard as worth his serious consideration. Page 77 Iron and Steel Factories Come Up in India The year was 1904. In the hot month of April, Charles Weld, an American geologist, and Durabji Tata, the eldest son of Jamsetji Tata, were travelling in Chhattisgarh in search of iron ore deposits. They had spent many months on a costly venture, looking for sources of good iron ore to set up a modern iron and steel plant in India. Jamsetji Tata had decided to spend a large part of his fortune to build a big iron and steel industry in India. 
but this could not be done without identifying the source of fine quality iron ore one day after traveling for many hours in the forests weld and durabji came upon a small village and found a group of men and women carrying basket loads of iron ore these people were the agarias when asked where they had found the iron ore the agarias pointed to a hill in the distance weld and durabji reached the hill after an exhausting trek through dense forests on exploring the hill the geologist declared that they had at last found what they had been looking for rajhara hills had one of the finest ores in the world but there was a problem the region was dry and water necessary for running the factory was not to be found nearby the tatars had to continue their search for a more suitable place to set up their factory however the agarias helped in the discovery of a source of iron ore that would later supply the bhilai steel plant a few years later a large area of forest was cleaned up on the banks of the river subarna rekha to set up the factory and an industrial township jamshedpur here there was water near iron ore deposits the tata iron and steel company or tisco that came up began producing steel in 1912 tisco was set up at an opportune time all through the late 19th century india was importing steel that was manufactured by britain expansion of the railways in india had provided a huge market for rails that britain produced what is slag heaps it is the waste left when smelting metal figure 14 the tata iron and steel factory on the banks of the river subarna rekha in 1940 page 78 for a long while british experts in the indian railways were unwilling to believe that good quality steel could be produced in india by the time tisco was set up the situation was changing in 1914 the first world war broke out steel produced in britain now had to meet the demands of war in europe so imports of british steel into india declined dramatically and the indian railways turned to tisco for supply of rails as the war dragged on for several years tisco had to produce shells and carriage wheels for the war by 1919 the colonial government was buying 90% of the steel manufactured by tisco over time tisco became the biggest steel industry within the british empire in the case of iron and steel as in the case of cotton textiles industrial expansion occurred only when british imports into india declined and the market for indian industrial goods increased figure 15 expansion at the end of the war to meet the demands of the war tisco had to expand its capacity and extend the size of its factory the program of expansion continued after the war here you see new power houses and boiler houses being built in jamshedpur in 1919 page 79 this happened during the first world war and after as the nationalist movement developed and the industrial class became stronger the demand for government protection became louder struggling to detain its control over india the british government had to concede many of these demands in the last decades of colonial rule elsewhere early years of industrialization in japan the history of industrialization of japan in the late 19th century presents a contrast 
to that of India. The colonial state in India, keen to expand the market for British goods, was unwilling to support Indian industrialists. In Japan, the state encouraged the growth of industries. The Meiji regime, which assumed power in Japan in 1868, believed that Japan needed to industrialize in order to resist Western domination. So, it initiated a series of measures to help industrialization. Postal services, telegraph, railways, steam-powered shipping were developed. The most advanced technology from the West was imported and adapted to the needs of Japan. Foreign experts were brought to train Japanese professionals. Industrialists were provided with generous loans for investments by banks set up by the government. Large industries were first started by the government and then sold off at cheap rates to business families. In India, colonial domination created barriers to industrialization. In Japan, the fear of foreign conquest spurred industrialization. But this also meant that the Japanese industrial development from the beginning was linked to military needs. Let's imagine. Imagine you are a textile weaver in late 19th century India. Textiles produced in Indian factories are flooding the market. How would you have adjusted to the situation? Let's recall. 1. What kinds of cloth had a large market in Europe? 2. What is Jamdani? 3. What is Bandana? 4. Who are the Agarya? Page 80. Fill in the blanks. A. The word chintz comes from the word dash. B. Tipu sword was made of dash steel. C. India's textile exports declined in the dash century. Let's discuss. 6. How do the names of different textiles tell us about their histories? 7. Why did the wool and silk producers in England protest against the import of Indian textiles in the early 18th century? 8. How did the development of cotton industries in Britain affect textile producers in India? 9. Why did the Indian iron smelting industry decline in the 19th century? 10. What problems did the Indian textile industry face in the early years of its development? 11. What helped Tisco expand steel production during the First World War? Let's do 12. Find out about the history of any craft around the area you live. You may wish to know about the community of craftsmen, the changes in the techniques they use and the markets they supply. How have these changed in the past 50 years? 13. On a map of India, locate the centres of different crafts today. Find out when these centres came up. The chapter 6 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator Akash Ahuja Technical Coordinator Bati Lang Lingdo Production Assistant Meenakshi Kukreti Producer Vandana Arimardhan Presented by C.I.E.T. N.C.E.R.T. New Delhi, India